Well, thanks, Sally. It's, uh, it's great to be here. And this is one of the first sort of talks that we've done to tell the world uh, that we're alive and kicking it up and running. And so I think it's fitting that we would do it here at Stanford. <clears throat> the challenge of our generation is to sustainably power the planet. I think everybody in this room believes that. And I think most of the people in this room, including myself, are involved in trying to find ways to do that. I want to talk today about some areas that uh, at least I personally uh, believe have some promise, just uh, exemplars, and to hopefully help you understand a little bit the way that we think about technologies at Breakthrough. But before we start that, I want to remember the three real big challenges that we have here. The first is scale, right? This is the ultimate challenge in the whole energy game, is the challenge of scale. We do energy at scales that dwarf any other human activities, and there's important implications to that scale. The second is cost. Energy is the ultimate undifferentiated uh, commodity, right? There are no difference between green electrons and, uh, and dirty electrons. And the fact of the matter is that people won't pay extra uh, for green electrons. So we have to be able to do things at cost and at scale. And the third is to remember that there is no possible way to do the kinds of things that we need to do here at the scales that we need to do them without any environmental consequences. So we have to be big boys and girls about all of that. The history of energy in America is a virtual uh, history of prosperity. If you lived in the United States in the first half of the 19th century, you were probably involved in agriculture. In 1830, 70% of Americans were involved in agriculture. And that work was backbreaking. An acre of wheat took 56 hours to farm uh, and produced 15 bushels of wheat. Your day began at sunset and ended at, at sunrise and ended at sunset because you didn't have access to artificial life, uh, to artificial light. Uh, energy for heat and for cooking came from burning wood. Um, if you didn't immigrate, you probably never traveled more than 50 miles from where you were born. Uh, in 2010, dollars per capita GDP was less than $5,000 per person. Artificial light at that point was among society's greatest needs, and in the first half of the 19th century, artificial light came primarily from whale oil. But by the middle of the century, whales were becoming scarce, and a new source of energy for light uh, was needed. That energy came from kerosene, first from seeps, uh, and later people discovered that you could drill holes uh, to get that out of there. Uh, Rockefeller was involved in that pursuit almost from the get-go. Um, and in 1869, Rockefeller and his buddy J.D. Flagler incorporated Standard Oil, which rapidly became the largest corporation in America and then later in the world. Almost from the beginning, a very powerful correlation between per capita energy use and per capita GDP um, emerged. The ready availability of cheap, clean energy changed lives in ways that we can't really imagine today. Uh, today we take light for granted, for instance, but even at the end of the 19th century, the average person used about five kilolumens of light. Today we use about 60 megalumens of light, a 12,000 fold increase. With artificial, uh, with artificial light, you controlled your day rather than your day controlling you. Productivity increased. New forms of energy enabled, uh, enabled cooking in ways that weren't possible before. Diets improved, health improved. But other forces were at work as well. In 1908, the first Model T rolls off the assembly line, uh, and it was powered by affordable gasoline. By 1914, it took only 93 minutes to assemble a Model T on a Ford assembly line. In 1903, the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk, and in 1926, Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic in an airplane. Transportation was changed forever, and it was powered entirely by access to cheap energy to liquid fuels. The, um, the link between energy becomes even clearer uh, as, we, as we move forward in time. In 1830, we mentioned 70% of the American workforce was involved in farming. By the end of the century, that number was 41%. By the end of the Second World War, that number was 7%. Productivity increased, increased massively. That bushel of wheat that took 56 hours to produce 15 bushels now took three hours to produce 31 bushels, a 50-fold increase in productivity. 
Electric light allowed all sorts of activities and new productivities. If you lived in the middle of the 20th century, you were probably involved in manufacturing. You got your energy for heat and cooking from oil and gas. You traveled by car. The creation of the interstate system enabled mass uh, migration patterns. Per capita energy use rose, and per capita GDP followed in absolute lockstep. Those trends only accelerated through the 20th century as the true possibilities afforded by cheap, abundant energy became clear. Today, uh, less than 2% of the American workforce is involved in agriculture, and America feeds a significant portion uh, of the world. In 1980, six of the top 10 companies in the world were oil companies. Energy use and prosperity continued to rise in lockstep across the course of the entire century, today giving us prosperity that we can't possibly imagine. But we know that tremendous challenges lurk on the horizon. Our population is rising. At the end of the, 20th, at the, end of the 19th century, the population of the planet was about 1.6 billion. At the end of the 20th century, it was 6 billion. Today, it's 7.5 billion. The United States has less than 5% of the world's population, and it, controls, it consumes nearly a quarter of the world's energy. But that's not surprising, because we're nearly a quarter of the world's GDP. But there's an obvious consequence there, as the rest of the world aspires to the same level of prosperity that we enjoy in the United States today, the demands on energy will be enormous. And the way we use energy today is not sustainable. The energy that we dig out of the ground in the form of oil and coal and gas is finite. We can have an argument about exactly how finite it is, but it is finite. There is no denying that. And there are environmental consequences to our use of oil and gas. Today, the surface of the Earth is hotter than it's been for 125,000 years. Sea levels risen a foot in the past 50 years. The last time the surface of the Earth was as warm as it is today, sea level is 25 foot higher than it is today. The high point in New York City is 30 feet above sea level. Miami is six feet above sea level. So we clearly need new ways to power the planet and ways that'll be sustainable. But as we think about those ways, we got to remember three things. The first is that energy is prosperity. We have a huge fraction of our population that has no or only limited access to energy. And those have that limited access has enormous consequences for prosperity. The rest of the world is going to demand the same level of prosperity that we enjoy. Surely they have a right to it. And energy is prosperity. The way we use energy today is both unsustainable and has enormous environmental consequences. And the rest of the world demanding access to energy will have huge consequences for the amounts of energy we need. The amount of energy that we need will likely double by the end of the century. So against this backdrop, in, 2000, in 2015 at Paris, in Paris at COP, the leaders of the developed world, the OECD world, announced Mission Innovation, an ambitious plan to double R&D spending on clean tech research by the end of the decade, by 2020. At the same time and on the same stage, Bill Gates announced the creation of the Breakthrough Energy Coalition, a group of 27 of the world's wealthiest and most influential individuals that was designed to provide private sector support for the development of clean tech research and bringing those technologies to market. Last year, in 2016, the coalition announced its first activity, the formation of Breakthrough Energy Ventures, a $1 billion venture fund uh, organized to, to, to support clean tech research. The fund is designed uh, to support research, uh, to, to, to view research potentials through a, a, a few different lenses. The first is climate impact. So we have drawn sort of a line in the sand and say for us to uh, support a technology, we'll look to see that that technology, when deployed at full scale, has the potential to mitigate at least half a gigaton a year of carbon potential, right? So roughly half a percent or 1% of global emissions. We look to make investments where our investment will catalyze or stimulate investments from other sources. We've assembled a team that has deep, deep scientific expertise and capabilities, and so we'll do deep scientific diligence on all the opportunities that come before us. And we'll also look to fill gaps where investment today is lacking. And as all of you in this room know, investment in that space is surely lacking. 
So we've begun today to look at some of the potential areas in which we might invest. And one of the ways that we've done that uh, is to think about global megatrends. What are the global megatrends that, that, are, that are sweeping across the planet today? What are the opportunities that are afforded by those megatrends? And, 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 and what are the consequences of those megatrends? So I'd just like to point out a couple of those and, and illustrate a little bit our thinking. Surely, one of the interesting trends that's emerged over the past little while is the enormous deployment of intermittent renewables, wind and solar. So we know last year here in the United States, nearly 70% of net additions to generating capacity uh, were from intermittent renewables. And coincident with that enormous uh, deployment of intermittent renewables has been an enormous decrease in the price of those intermittent renewables. Today, PPAs for wind and solar are routinely signed at under $20 uh, a megawatt hour, right? So less than two cents a kilowatt hour for electricity. And so one of the interesting megatrends that offers both challenges and opportunities is the enormous quantity of very low price renewable electricity that's available today. Well, let's think about the consequences of, uh, uh, of, of, that, of that megatrend. There's a map of Europe uh, that shows a number of countries and the extent to which they rely on zero carbon or renewable energy for uh, the production of, of their electricity. And there's some places that you see that you would have guessed that sort of makes sense. Scandinavia with an enormous access to hydroelectricity, Iceland with an enormous geothermal uh, resource, France with its long-standing commitment to nuclear energy, but Spain and Portugal? Spain and Portugal generate nearly 50% of their electricity from wind and a little bit of solar as well from intermittent resources. So how is that possible? Well, Spain and Portugal have access to a very unique resource. They have both a topology, a geography, and access to water that permits uh, pumped hydro storage, or an opportunity to store that intermittent energy to be used at a time when it's actually needed. So that works well if you happen to be in a place that has that resource available to it. But if you don't, it's a problem. Right? And we can look at China, which has obviously been incredibly ambitious in its deployment of wind and solar resources. And if you see in places like Inner Mongolia, where there isn't access to water and the resources that are needed for pumped hydro, we see enormous amounts of, of wind energy curtailed, or basically just dumped, because there's nobody to take it. So how do we fix that problem? especially if we imagine that uh, deployment of renewables, uh, intermittent renewables will happen in other regions as well. Well, there is a variety of things we can do, uh, some of which are amenable to technological solutions and some of which aren't. So we can use an optimal mix of wind and solar. We can use transmission. There's challenges there with property rights and right away. We can adjust use patterns. But two that I'd like to talk about today is we can develop storage technologies that don't rely on special access to natural resources. And we can also think about alternative, flexible, uh, dispatchable zero carbon sources of energy. So let's think a little bit about storage first. First interesting question is, um, you know, how much storage do we actually need? Well, that's kind of an interesting exercise to go through. So here's some data. Uh, this is data that was supplied by General Compression, actually. This is uh, data from a wind farm. So imagine that you have a 100 megawatt hour PPA. That's the line right in the middle there. And this is actual output from a wind farm. The way to read this is everything that's in light blue uh, is energy that I'm using to meet my commitment under my PPA. Everything that is in orange is energy that I'm dumping or curtailing because I, it's above what's, what's needed, required for my PPA, and I have nothing to do with it. And everything that's in red is energy that I'm short, my PPA, energy that I'm going to have to go buy on the spot market to meet my commitments. That's no storage at all. So let's add some storage. Let's add eight hours of storage. What happens now? Well, things get better, okay? Same color scheme as before, uh, except now the energy in the dark blue is energy that I'm taking out of storage, and energy in green is excess energy that I'm able to put into storage. But you can see that even with eight hours of storage, I'm really nowhere close to enough. I'm still missing big chunks of energy that I'm obligated to provide the grid as a result of my PPA. How about 200? Well, there's where I need to get to, to actually use this intermittent resource, wind, to meet my obligations under my PPA. 200 hours of storage. 
Now that's five days, okay? If I extended this and said, how much storage am I going to need to meet my obligations at 99.9% .9 over the course of a year, that number is going to be a lot more than 200 hours. It's going to be more like 200 days, okay? So I need enormous amounts of storage. Hmm, that's challenging. Well, how much can that storage cost? Let's think about that. Cost of storage really isn't all that complicated. It's the capital to deploy it, plus the O&M and the energy that I put into it, divided by the total energy that I get out of it, okay? Uh, adjusted for, for, for interest rates. The less I'm gonna use an asset, the less it has to cost, because I have fewer cycles, less energy to take out of it to recover my cost. So if I'm going to build a seasonal storage resource, something that's going to store energy for 200 days and is only going to cycle once or twice over the course of a month, that's going to have to be very low cost storage. So here's a, an interesting plot that was published just a couple of weeks ago by Yetming Chang and his coworkers at MIT that shows exactly how much storage can cost as a function of duration. You can see that if I need to store energy for a couple of hours, I'm in pretty good shape. I can afford to spend a couple of hundred dollars a kilowatt hour for that energy storage. If I need to store energy for 10 or for 12 hours, I'm gonna have to be under $100 a kilowatt hour. If I have to store energy for days or weeks, I'm gonna have to be under $10 a kilowatt hour. So where are we now? How does that line up? How does that requirement line up with where we are now? Well. For short-term energy storage, if I need four-hour blocks for peaking, things like that, I'm in pretty good shape. Lithium ion is already there, or it will be there very soon, so that's fine. How about intermediate levels? Well, now it's a little bit tricky, okay? Because it depends what you mean by intermediate times. Do you mean eight hours? Do you mean 10 hours? Do you mean 12 hours? And it also depends on how low you think lithium ion is gonna go. Is lithium ion gonna get to $120 a kilowatt hour? Is it gonna get to $100 a kilowatt hour? going to go under $100 a kilowatt hour. It's a little bit tricky there, okay? So maybe we're okay, maybe we're not. Baseload, if I need to store energy for days or weeks, no chance, right? We've got nothing that comes even close to this. There's a lot of interesting technologies that are out there that have the potential to meet the need at both the intermediate and long-term storages. Let's think about the intermediate term. This is a very interesting design developed right here by Bob Laughlin at Stanford, right? And the idea here is that we're gonna store energy in the form of heat stored in molten salt, solar salt, put that energy in, convert it from electrical energy to heat through a heat pump, take it back out through a turbine. And that's kind of an interesting approach. Uh, the approach is actually being developed just down the road uh, at Google X. And you can see now that this thing asymptotes to the cost of solar salt, which is about $30 a kilowatt hour. Now, obviously, you've got to work in all of the stuff for turbines and heat pumps and heat exchangers and everything else. But if you, you, know, if you get big enough, that's, that's the asymptote. So that looks like sort of perhaps an interesting approach to intermediate storage. What about long-term storage? Well, there's electrochemical approaches, of course, but if I'm gonna do electrochemical approaches and I need to get under $10 a kilowatt hour, I'm gonna to have to use awfully, awfully, awfully cheap electrolytes, right? Things like sulfur. So aqueous sulfide batteries is a concept that's been kicking around for a little while. Or metal air batteries using iron, right? So you can use sulfur, you can use iron. You can't use lithium, you sure can't use lithium at all. So there's extreme constraints, but there's possible solutions that are out there on the horizon. Well, another way to deal with intermittent renewables, we said, was zero, co uh, zero carbon approaches um, to baseload power. So let's think about some of those. How about geothermal? Geothermal is an interesting idea, uh, taking advantage of the heat that lives at the center of the Earth. For the most part, up till now, Geothermal has relied on a specialized geography. Basically, you needed a place where the heat was close enough to the surface of the Earth, where there was water to carry the heat to the surface, and where there was sufficient porosity in the rock underlying to give you access to enough heat. And so there were a few special places on Earth, some in the western United States, but most notably in Iceland, pictured here, that give you that opportunity. 
Today, enhanced geothermal or engineered geothermal is another approach that allows us to access resource that's not available um, under those sort of conventional terms. And the idea here is we'll pump water down a hole into rock that's at varying temperature, depending on where you are and how do deep you go, and then use a second well to extract that heat and some sort of device to convert that heat into energy. That's a relatively small resource at the moment, but there's every reason to believe that that resource is about to grow and grow rather significantly. Using, taking advantage of advances in drilling technology that come out of the oil and gas uh, industry for fracking. And also fundamental research. Remember, if you're gonna frack rock for heat, you're fracking granite. You're not fracking limestone and sandstone, the kind of rock that you'd frack to, to access oil. So fundamental research on the mechanism of fracture formation the way that propants work to hold things open, all sorts of things like that. But there's a tremendous amount of research that enables this opportunity, and uh, I think that many people believe that this can be a fairly significant um, opportunity. So intermittent renewables, an important global trend that leads to a, a, a number of other interesting opportunities. Let's think about another uh, interesting trend, a burgeoning middle class. We mentioned that the population of the planet today is already uh, at seven and a half billion and is projected to be somewhere between nine and 10 billion by the end of the century. And the biggest change is not just the number of people, okay, but a growing, uh, but, but growing wealth. And that growing wealth, the emergence of this middle class, uh, has incredibly important um, implications. So the first is just access to energy, right? We mentioned that energy is prosperity. The two are absolutely indistinguishable. And so as this middle class emerges, it's going to demand energy. And there's still a huge number of people on this planet, perhaps as many as 2 billion, that have either no or only intermittent access to energy. So how are we going to provide energy to those people? The first thing that's really, really, really important to remember is that every one of these places that you look at is different. There is no one-size-fits-all solution. In some instances, the problems are political. In some instances, the problems are resource. There's all sorts of different problems. And so understanding the, the particular set of problems that lead to a lack of energy access uh, in each instance is incredibly important. So let's think about one uh, case, Nigeria. Nigeria is sort of an interesting place, relatively high per capita GDP. It's a petro-state. Today, the vast majority of its electricity comes from oil-fired generators. A little bit of hydro, but mostly oil-fired generators. But Nigeria has obviously fairly serious political problems as well. There's on the order of uh, 12,000 megawatts, 12 gigawatts of electrical energy, in theory, installed, uh, but probably less than two gigawatts of that is actually delivered. There are 11 utilities in Nigeria. All of them are insolvent. Uh, so people have access to energy only a few hours a day is the way this works out. So how are we going to fix that? Well, there's a variety of possible solutions. One is we could build a Western-style grid for Africa. Well, McKinsey says that it likely cost a trillion dollars. So even if you discount all of the political problems, a trillion dollars is a pretty heavy lift. So I don't think we're going to think about that one right at the moment. But there's a number of interesting opportunities that involve some combination of photovoltaic resource and storage as a way to power Africa. So let's think about that uh, a little bit. If you are a member of the middle class and you live in Nigeria, you think about power as an appliance rather than as a service. Here we think about energy as a service. You go and you, you connect to the local utility and then you plug whatever you want into the wall and you use energy on some sort of a metered rate. If you live in Nigeria, you think about energy as an appliance. You go to your equivalent of the Home Depot and you buy a box that looks like this. And that comes with a 280 watt solar panel uh, and a little bit of storage and perhaps um, uh, some, some sort of an inverter. And that isn't gonna run uh, a heat pump or something like that, but what it's gonna let you do is charge your cell phone, run a few lights, uh, maybe run a small refrigerator. Because we have a relatively wealthy population who are rapidly urbanizing, and remember that that's another important population trend, one that we'll talk more about in a moment, there's tremendous opportunity, oops, I got one slide behind there, so there's the little box that you're gonna buy. There's tremendous opportunities to connect multiple of these units together. Right? If you can use inverters that are smart enough at 280 watts 
to, to, uh, to decide who's going to be the master, who's going to be the slave, get a single waveform, and, and, then, and then run storage. And this is something that I think has a real opportunity for connecting small communities together and giving them access to much more reliable um, energy. And the obvious uh, attraction of microgrids as well is then it's possible to add other resources over time, both DC and AC resources, but there's clear need for important power electronics to be developed as you go there. Let's think about some other implications of that burgeoning middle class. Uh, what'll we eat, right? So there's this incredible correlation between per capita GDP um, and per capita calorie intake. The more people make, the more people eat. And perhaps even more problematically, the more people make, the more meat they eat. And food in general, and meat in particular, uh, has incredibly potent uh, uh, implications for global warming and for the production of greenhouse gases. In fact, I'm sure many of you have seen Paul Hawken and co-worker's book Drawdown that uh, goes through the 100 most impactful solutions uh, that are available for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And number four on that list of 100 is stop eating meat. So let's think a little bit uh, about how we might mitigate the problems associated um, with, um, with greenhouse gases from meat. Ruminants uh, are tasty. Um, ruminants uh, produce enormous amounts of greenhouse gases, and really in two ways. One is in growing them, and feeding them, and moving them, and taking care of them, watering them, all of those kinds of things. But ruminants also produce enormous amounts of methane, right, through flatulence and belching. And this is sort of an interesting uh, byproduct of the way ruminants are put together. So you know the ruminant stomach has four pouches, and behind the rumen are three other pouches, and many of those pouches, it turns out, contain a series of archaea as components of the, 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 the commensal population of microorganisms that live in the cow gut. And a bunch of those archaea contain within them methanogens that take CO2, steel reducing equivalents from all over the place, and generate methane. Well, there's been a series of interesting studies that have been done over the last little while that have identified small molecule inhibitors of some of those archaea, and you can stop animals uh, from, from producing methane. Well, that's fine if the animals happen to be living on a feedlot, right, or in a barn, but it doesn't really help very much if you're out at pasture. So I think we need to think about some other solutions. Well, one thing that we could do would be to stop eating cows, stop eating ruminants, right? And that certainly helps. Chicken is about five times better uh, than, than beef for the production of greenhouse gases. But chicken is still 40 times worse than chickpeas, right? So it's still a problem. It's better, but it's still a problem. So are there other things that we can do? Well, sure there are. So one is to switch to plant-based protein, uh, protein substitutes, right? And one that I'm sure you've all heard of has got uh, all sorts of press, and again, out of Stanford here, is impossible. Uh, this is a very clever approach where a group of scientists spend time looking at, at a molecular level at the components of meat that are responsible for its flavor. And heme is the one that's got uh, most of the press. They've engineered a strain of yeast that produces heat that they can add, then add to a, 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 a vegetable base uh, to, to make something that, that tastes like meat. That's kind of an interesting idea. Another approach is to get rid of the animals altogether, so-called clean meat, right? So here what we do is we take cells uh, from an organism and we actually grow those cells in, in tissue culture and we grow meat without the need for animals. And there's a number of companies that are working on this. Memphis Meats, Clean Meat. Uh, it's actually been around for quite some time. NASA ran a program around this for fish in the 1980s um, to enable long-term uh, space flight. PETA has run a couple of challenges uh, in this space for the production of clean meat. And the Good Food Institute, which is recently emerged, is dedicated entirely to helping companies that are working on clean meat. Another way to do this is to, to look to the oceans as a source of protein. Fish farming has been around for a long time. We know that fish farming close to shore is hugely problematic, causes pollution. There's issues of, 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 uh, uh, of species invasion, things like that. There's a number of companies today that are looking at farming in the deep ocean uh, and all sorts of crazy approaches. Uh, there's even one group that's trying to take uh, uh, small tuna fry uh, uh, in, in case, uh, 
capture them, hold them in, in, in giant cages like this, turn them loose off Mexico, and they'd float across the Pacific uh, under the ocean currents and arrive uh, in Japan as full-sized sushi and sashimi grade uh, tuna. Uh, th there's some interesting challenges here associated with taking care of these fish and feeding these fish and doing all sorts of things, some tremendous opportunities in robotics and things like that. But looking to the oceans as a way to feed the planet, I think, is another thing that we should look at. So some really interesting implications as we have this burgeoning middle class for the, from the perspective of greenhouse gases, right, which of course is what Breakthrough is all about, uh, from the perspective of food. Where will we live? One of the most powerful megatrends that's going on right now is urbanization, right? So here is a really interesting graphic in 1900, about 20% of the population lived in urban areas. By 2050, 70% of the population of this planet will live in urban areas. Today, 200,000 people per day move to urban areas. 200,000 people per day move to urban areas. This planet needs to spend $1 trillion a year for the next 30 years to build the infrastructure that'll be necessary to house those people, right? That's a staggering number. It's an absolutely staggering number to think about. And the way we build that infrastructure, I would argue, will we'll almost decide whether we sing, sink or swim. The construction industry is a, a, a remarkably conservative industry, right? Um, this is a very, very high volume, low margin business, typically 2% margins. There is no R&D. The way we build buildings today is exactly the same as we built buildings 50 years ago. If you went to a job site today uh, on a high rise building, it would look exactly the same as it did 50 years ago, in the sense that it'll be built primarily with steel and concrete. Steel and concrete are enormously bad actors from the perspective of emissions. Just concrete is responsible for 5% of global emissions. 5% of global emissions, just concrete. And steel and other metals are hugely problematic as well. So thinking about alternatives to steel and concrete as a way to build this infrastructure that we're going to have to build is something that I think we really need to do. Well, before you get too technological on me here, uh, you know, there's a bunch of other interesting alternatives that exist already. Wood is an interesting one. There's been some tremendous technological advances in wood in the way we use wood today. I'm not talking about two-by materials that are cut to length on a job site, but engineered wood, right? So for instance, mass timber or cross-laminated timber. It turns out that if you laminate timber and you cross the grain on each laminate, you take all the flex out of the beam and you end up with a beam that behaves much more like a steel beam than a, than a, than a wood beam or nail laminated timber, glue laminated timber. There's an enormous number of advances in the production of mass timber that can be used in the place of steel in tall buildings. We're not talking about houses here, in tall buildings. Now obviously you're all sitting there thinking, well that's great until it burns. But it turns out that wood does really well in fires as well. Wood has a natural defense from burning, wood chars, and that charring protects the wood from burning. And so it turns out that in a burn through test, wood burns at the rate of about an inch and an eighth an hour, right? Which is more than enough to satisfy building codes, and it has in numerous districts. Wood also doesn't buckle the way steel does in fires. And so from some perspectives, it performs better in fires than steel does. And this is a practical reality today. This is a practical reality today. This is an 18-story, 400-unit uh, university residence that's currently under construction in Vancouver at the University of British Columbia, built entirely with wood, okay? Not a dream. The industry needs help in advancing these technologies towards marketplace, but there's, there, there are opportunities that are available to us today to get rid of steel and concrete. And there's lots of interesting opportunities beyond wood, right? Fiber is the way that we build things. Nobody builds boats out of wood anymore, right? Nobody builds boats out of wood anymore. People build boats out of composites. Why? Because they have enormous strengths. So fiber of various forms, whether it's fiber, carbon nanotubules, all sorts of things um, can be built into all sorts of construction pieces and used to build buildings. There's a number, Mark Goulthorpe, for instance, an architect at the MIT School of Architecture, is building, designing very interesting buildings. And remember, too, that when you build with composites, you get away from post and beam construction. And so you could now build shapes 
and spaces that you can't even think about building uh, with post and beam construction and with conventional steel and concrete. And people are actually doing this. This is a, 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 an automobile bridge in Poland uh, that's built entirely with composites. No steel, no concrete, just, just composite materials. Sustainably powering our planet is the challenge of our generation. It is the challenge of our generation. It's literally an existential question for our species, right? This is hard work. There's gonna be lots of skin knees and split lips. This is big boy and big girl stuff. There will be setbacks along the way. But there's a passionate group of people out there, including many of the people in this room, who are committed to finding the technologies that we need to get this job done. And I hope that Breakthrough Energy Ventures will be there to help all of you bring those technologies to market. Thanks very much. Thanks for the really good talk. Um, I had a question in your first part of the talk. Where do you see things like nuclear and carbon capture and storage uh, in the you know, carbon <laughs> dispatchable power? You mean everything else I didn't talk about? Um, well, you know, you know it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated set of questions, and, and I'd be happy to talk about uh, any of those that you'd like. I mean, the challenge uh, with nuclear uh, to date has, has not been safety. It's not been waste disposal. It's been cost. Uh, it's just too expensive, right? Um, and, and, and I think that becomes even more challenging in an issue when people are signing PPAs for intermittent wind and solar for $20 a megawatt hour, right? So if there are approaches that we believe can cut uh, the installed cost of nuclear by 10x, would I be interested in that? Absolutely, I'd be interested in that. And I would make similar comments about fusion. I've seen no reason to imagine that fusion is gonna be cheaper to build uh, and, and deploy um, than, than, than fission is. Uh, carbon capture is a, is a, a, a much more complicated, um, a much more complicated uh, question. Um, actually, I, I find air capture uh, fairly interesting right now. Um, I know Arun and I have talked about this many, many times in the famous APS study uh, that said, you know, somewhere between $700 and $1,000 a ton to do air capture. An awful lot of people out there now are saying they can do it for $150 a ton or maybe even $100 a ton. That's pretty interesting. Uh, air capture from point sources, I'm maybe a little bit less interested than that for a complicated set of reasons I'd be happy to talk to you about. Hi, um, so the uh, criteria you have for selecting your ventures um, reminds me of uh, impact investing type of uh, focus. Um, are you looking at things as early stage as R&D that have a very huge impact, like cold fusion? Or are you also <laughs> looking at things in short term, like scaling a nanomaterial process that reduces uh, capacity costs? Well, so, so, so what I would say to that is yes, okay? I mean, we are organized as a fund. Uh, we're organized as a fund. We have uh, LPs. Uh, it's organized as a 20-year fund, but, um, you know, the LPs are, 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 are looking to make a return, and the fund is designed um, to make a return. I think the 20-year nature of the fund allows us to uh, work on things that a traditional fund, a traditional 10-year closed-end fund would not be able to do. We do have more runway to approach things. Um, you know who our investors are, and you know what their interests are. You know, look, a, a billion dollars sounds like a lot of money, right? And, it, and it's, in some ways, it is a lot of money. But from the perspective of energy and the job that needs to be done here, it's not, right? And I think that one of the most important things that we can do here uh, is to show the world that there is a way to invest in these technologies and make money. If you construct the right fund in the right way with the right LPs and all of those kinds of things, that there is a way to make money doing this because that'll attract more money to the space and that's really what's needed. So you know who my LPs are and you know how they think about the world, but I think it's important for us to make money and we're gonna to try to make money. I 
I thought uh, when Bill Gates uh, initially announced at COP21 uh, the amount of dollars uh, that might be committed to the uh, uh, breakthrough fund was close to the $10 billion over X number of years. And you show the number of above $1 billion. How, was I wrong? Or was, can, you, can you talk a bit about that? Sure. Uh, so, um, you know, Bill is absolutely in this for the long haul. Bill would like to attract $10 billion to this. Bill has uh, said publicly that he intends to put $2 billion just of his own money into this. Um, so there's no doubt that Bill is, is committed to doing this. Um, BEV and our billion dollar fund is, is the first activity uh, along that arc. Yeah, hi, thanks for uh, mentioning Paul Hawken and Drawdown. I think there's a lot of promise in those hundred. Any particular ones that you're looking at within there, you know, uh, that look promising and, and what, what's been funded so far in the... In the... Uh, well, so I, I'm not gonna make any comments about, about funding uh, that, that, that's happened so far. None, there's nothing that, that's been made public about that. You know, I think Paul Hawkins' book is a very interesting book. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, there was a group of people who, even before uh, any of the people who are at Breakthrough Now got there, uh, created a list of 55 quests um, in the five sort of areas that we want to work in, which is electricity, transportation, buildings, manufacturing, and ag. And I would say that, that almost all of the things that are in the Hawkins book are, are, were already on that, that list in, in one form or another. You know, n not all of the things in, in Paul's book lend themselves to venture-based solutions, right? Um, you know, that, that many of their solutions are focused on, on what they call ag, but is really more what I would call conservation and things like that that don't lend themselves to. So I, I think it's a great book. It, it's very interesting reading. I think everyone should read it. But I would say that, that most of the things that are in there were already on our radar screen. Thanks so much. <clears throat> I was just curious, are you looking at any sort of carbon negative technologies as well? I mean, well, I would argue that that's one of the attractive features of tall wood buildings, uh, is that they are in fact carbon negative, right? If I take carbon out of the air to grow a tree and then sequester it in a building for 100 years, that's a, that's a carbon negative solution. So yes, we're, we're absolutely looking at carbon negative solutions. Um, are you aware of ultra-high performance concrete, which is, okay, I near it, nodding it. Are you aware of the Bosch captive column? You know, so, so, so there are a lot of interesting materials out there, right, um, th that, that, that are plausible alternatives to, to concrete. There are a lot of interesting technologies out there that are plausible alternatives to producing steel uh, and, and other metals. And I would say that we are looking at all of those things. I will tell you that you know, the construction industry is unbelievably conservative, and, and I think for good reasons. You know, if you were an engineer who had to sign off on the final design of a building and certify that this building was going to function as built for 100 years, and you were going to use a cement that had never been used before, how excited would you be about that? Well, actually, so I think that... there's challenges with deploying those, those materials and those approaches. We know about them, we're interested in them, but it's hard. The UHPC came from the Pantheon and the aqueducts in Rome. It's 2,000 years of testing. Yeah, it, not, not, not exactly the same as modern building standards, but point taken. I know you, you, your talk was about technology, but why didn't you talk about the carbon tax? <laughs> That's an interesting question. As a matter of fact, almost nobody here <coughs> talked about the tax. So we've talked about this a lot, and uh, what we actually heard uh, from our LPs is that they would prefer that we focused on technologies that didn't need a carbon tax. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of technologies that we're going to need and that we're going to want to look at that, that there's no way to make them work without a carbon tax. 
So I think there's some things that, that, that we're going we're, we're gonna to want to look at. It's surprising how much of the world already has a carbon tax. I think everybody feels that a carbon tax in the United States is inevitable over some period of time. But, but at, for the time being, we're not explicitly considering a carbon tax when we evaluate technologies. Um, since I've got the mic, so I'm going to ask you a question. So I was really struck by your number about what it would cost to build a grid in Africa and to build the generating facilities. McKinsey, not my number. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> McKinsey's number, you know, and I don't know whether they are expensive or, but, but what struck, struck me is it was less than a billion dollars. It was a trillion dollars. Uh, Oh, it was a trillion. Yeah. Trillion. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. That's why we that. discounted it. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I think it really is one of the interesting questions. You can look at investing in innovation. You can also look at investing in improving the quality of people's lives today and, and reaping the rewards of their prospering as they get access to modern infrastructure. Uh, it, where is that debate going on? Uh, uh, well, so, 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 so I, I would say that, that people uh, reflect those preferences and those desires uh, through their ability to spend money. And, and so, um, you know, to the extent that we can build companies that are viable, functioning companies that can sell product, then I, then I think we've, we've met that goal. That, that would be how I would weasel out of that question. <laughs> <laughs> talked about urbanization, but you didn't say a word about transportation. Do you have a few thoughts about transportation? We have a lot of thoughts about transportation. Um, what would you like to talk about? I mean, so, so we certainly believe that electrification and automation are going to be important uh, are going to be important drivers and that those drivers have profound implications. You know, I'll tell you, I'll put it out there, we also believe that liquid fuels are going to be with us for a long time. Uh, and that finding ways to develop zero carbon liquid fuels is something that, that's a problem we're gonna have to solve. Um, I, you know, there's a billion vehicles, gasoline powered vehicles on the road today. Uh, even some of the most ambitious projections for EV sales, um, you know, by 2030, uh, you know, have 50 or 60% uh, electric vehicles. And so, you know, it's not hard, it, by 2050, it's projected that there'll be 3 billion vehicles on the road. So it's not hard to imagine that there could be more gasoline-powered vehicles on the road uh, in 2050 than there are today, even with very aggressive deployment of EVs um, and AVs. And then, of course, there's significant components of the transportation industry that just don't lend themselves to electrification. So, so I think that liquid fuels are, are, are going to be important for a long time. So I noticed the graphic that you had from general compression, and yeah. I just wanted to ask uh, where you see compressed air energy storage fitting into the picture. <clears throat> um, above ground compressed air energy storage? Uh, either. Well, so, so, so cave energy storage I think is, is great, if, but it's, it's, it's geographically restricted to a very small um, number of locations, and so I'm not sure that's something that we would get involved in. I'm not sure that there's big technological risk, risks there. I think the challenge, obviously, with above ground compressed air energy storage has been cost. I mean, you've seen the cost targets that you're going to have to hit. Um, you, you know, and, and it's, it's sort of a double whammy, right? If you're going to go after the peaker market, you're done because lithium ion is going to do that. It's, it's, it's over, right? Um, if you're going to do the intermediate market, then you're probably going to have to be fairly significantly under $100 a kilowatt hour. And I'm not sure that above ground compressed air can get to, to, that, to that level. So look at it, interested in it, but the, the, the metrics are really, really, really tough. Thank you. Thank you.